Welcome to Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania. Located in Northeast Crawford County along the shores of French Creek, Cambridge Springs is a town filled with rich history and local pride. Join us as residents show and tell everything that makes their community a great hometown. I'm Dale Doctor. I'm president here at the Cambridge Springs Heritage Society. Um, my topic that I'm going to be talking about is the early years of the mineral, or early settlement and the mineral water boom here in Cambridge. Uh, here in western Pennsylvania, it was Seneca Native Americans that occupied this territory uh, until about 1801. You had then um, the Holland Land Company was set up down in Meadville to sell off these various plots in western Pennsylvania and Ohio's Western Reserve. And um, so plot 127, it's the 100 acres that he occupies most of Cambridge now, was, um, was purchased by Job Van Court and his son Benjamin. Um, both were married, had their own families, uh, established a log cabin over on French Creek. Um, but by 1814, um, payments weren't being made necessarily, so the property was taken back and resold to Nathaniel Cummings. Uh, there's a street here in Cambridge that's um, referred to as Cummings Street, and for a time it was also called Cambridge. Cambridge was called Cummings Town uh, until about 1822. Cambridge went through a variety of, of names over the years, but we won't get into those necessarily. But, um, but the big change then would have been about 1897, whenever we went from Cambridge to Cambridge Springs to reflect in the mineral water importances here in Cambridge. Um, Cambridge kind of had a slow growth up until about 1853. There was a Dr. John Gray uh, that had settled here in Cambridge. Uh, he had property on the north edge of town where he also had a farm established. Uh, he would ride the circuit and tend to uh, his patients throughout the region as well as having hours here in, in town. Uh, by 1859, then, you had oil fever spreading through the whole region after Colonel Drake had hit oil over in Titusville uh, there in 1859. So Dr. Gray, thinking he might have oil on his property as well, had gone out with a 16-foot rod and started probing around his property north of town to see if he could find oil. High ground, dry ground, he really wasn't able to do much, but he got down along the, uh, towards the creek in one of its tributaries and hit some soft ground and the rod seemed to push into the ground so he just started pushing until it went the full 16 foot of the rod, pulled it out and it wasn't oil that he found. What he hit was an actual artesian spring. So he rushed over to home about a quarter mile away, came back with an old gun barrel to case his well and um, just the water continued to flow. Local farmers might stop to drink from it from time to time with no ill effects ever noted about it. Um, and so he basically ignored the well from 1860 until 1884. Uh, he had taken his brother-in-law to Hot Springs, Arkansas uh, for the mineral waters down there at Blue Spring. And he couldn't help but notice that the waters there tasted an awful lot like what he had in his spring out here. So he came back, had it um, sent off for analysis, and he came back with high levels of iron, sulfur, magnesia, and so, why not capitalize on what was already being done elsewhere in the country? So he starts prescribing uh, the mineral waters um, at that point after 1884. Well, locals were coming in, word was getting out, more and more people were coming to town for the mineral waters. And uh, by 1886, uh, he had already established a tent out there with a turnstile, uh, one to take the money, one person to collect the money and another to go ahead and uh, pour the water for the individuals. And um, 1886, they were establishing the, um, the Gray Mineral Fountain Company. A group of investors came up with about $50,000 to, uh, to build a sanitarium, uh, the first 30 by 100 foot part of what's now the, well, used to be the Riverside Inn. And uh, so they were establishing the sanitarium and they had built a boardwalk out across about a quarter mile north out across Miller Station Road to where they now had a new structure out there. It was a uh, Gray's Mineral Springs out there. By 1890, they, the group of investors were having a hard time keeping up with their payments as well. 
And so the, the bank took the property back at a sheriff's sale and resold it now to William Ryder from Franklin, who had plans to maybe turn this now into more of a resort instead. So he started adding on to the hotel. He, um, he now built a second spring house now to the south side of Miller Station Road so that the, uh, the boardwalk didn't have to go up and over the, uh, the road. Uh, they added a barn, a jersey herd. They added the casino, uh, which we knew as the ballroom. Uh, they added um, an east wing to the hotel, made many improvements to the hotel. Uh, he went through a couple of investors, but by 1895, with a dispute with um, some of his investors, I uh, ended up going to court, and the judge finally decreed that due to uh, irreconcilable differences that they were going to have to um, sell the hotel, dissolve the partnership and sell the hotel. So that's whenever the Baird family came into uh, the hotel business, and they were there from 1895 until 1946. The Mineral Springs, in addition to the early hotels and the development of the hotels, um, the town started to grow, had experienced a very rapid period of growth in the 1890s and in the early 1900s. Uh, you had a total of 16 hotels that developed. You had uh, about 40 guest cottages. You had 14 Mineral Springs. They were calling springs, but other than the Gray Spring, the rest were all drilled wells. The deepest of those was about a 300-foot well that they drilled. Um, you had plenty of entertainment here in town as well. You had um, an opera house, you had four theaters, you had an amusement arcade, uh, we had an amusement park that existed from 1912 to about 1917. Hard to imagine a little town like Cambridge having its own amusement park, but we did. And. Uh, we had numbers of people coming in to Cambridge, which were a lot of times pretty hard to imagine. Um, by 1890, Cambridge is only a population of about, about 700, but by the time, by 1897, it had more than doubled our population. Then uh, about 1912, 1915, with the advent of the automobile, things started to change. What now is changing is that, that uh, People could come by automobile, stay a few days, and continue on. So now we're just a stopping point, not a destination. Uh, the Bairds at the hotel were starting to see that, you know, we need to look ahead. We need to look at some different things here. So they started to look at, well, what about golf? So by 1916, they had the first nine holes of the Riverside Golf Course, and then they expanded that to a full 18 holes in 1923. Uh, other changes were starting to happen, be not just because of the automobile, but also modern medicine was starting to say that what was wrong with you couldn't be cured just by flushing your system with lots of mineral waters. So by the time you got to about 1925, um, Cambridge was starting to lose that mineral water craze. Definitely the craze was over by that point, but uh, still you had significant amount of people still came here just as a summer destination and really continued on for many years you know as we continued to see a lot of the cottages turn back into private residences my name is john workmeister my interest in cambridge springs was deals with the demography of cambridge springs from 1900 to 1920 in 1890, Cambridge Springs population was 912. That population went increased by 63% by 1900. The newspaper in 1900 commented, the Enterprise, the Cambridge Springs newspaper, said that we have gone through a great period of transition. And just imagine what the next 10 years would bring. In 1900, Cambridge Springs had 60 larger and smaller hotels and guest houses, mineral springs, nine trains stopping a day between New York and Chicago. Um, in the time when cities were becoming increasingly polluted, like Pittsburgh as the infamous Industrial Revolution would have it, the petite bourgeois would typically put their families on trains and they would spend weeks at a time for the clean air and the waters of Cambridge Springs. Now, at 1900, it appears that the future was bright, but the Pure Food and Drug Act, which was passed in 1907, was one of the death knells for the Cambridge Springs industry. By 1910, that population had only grown 1%. And my interest in the demography of Cambridge was geographic persistence. That was, were people willing to stay or were they leaving? 
and even more importantly, who were the ones who left compared to the ones that stayed. There were scores of people in Cambridge Springs who listed their occupation as related to the mineral spring industry. They were bath attendants, uh, laundresses at the hotel, hotel proprietors, bellboys. And of the scores of people who listed that as their occupation in 1900, only one of those people I found remained, and that was Will Barrett, who was the proprietor of the Riverside Inn, which was the, really the only hotel that would sustain itself over the long period of time. Well, you know, the Cambridge, of course, had to chart its own history. In the 1890s, they were building housing stock, and that area would stretch up eastward on town on the hill where the famous Ryder Hotel was built in the late 1890s. This building, when completed, was the largest wooden structure between New York and Chicago, and was supposed to be the model for this the new growing health resort. It's funny because the Ryder, the Ryder Hotel, the, the proprietor was actually one of the original people in the Riverside Inn. He was squeezed out and was going to make a statement by building a hotel much bigger than the one that would outlast his. But by, by the mid part of the, the, the first decade of the 20th century, it wasn't sustaining itself. It was too expensive to keep, the crowds were smaller, and eventually it went into receivership. There was a period of time where they were going to use it as a, a health resort for radiation treatment, which was kind of in its infancy at the time. That didn't pan out so well. But the fortunate location of Cambridge Springs, halfway between New York and Chicago, the two largest centers of Polish population in the United States, made it a, a buy for the Polish National Alliance, and that hotel would be turned into the, the seat of the Alliance College. So that's really where the transition takes place. Well, there are internal and external factors that would deal with the transition of Cambridge. Some were unique to Cambridge. It's short-lived history as a mineral spring industry. That would be the Pure Food and Drug Act, and that did a lot. The destruction of that industry, or not the destruction of it, but the decline of that industry had a major impact in changing the nature of town. But another national trend which had a longer term effect was the eclipse of the community. In a small town like Cambridge or wherever, you go to the bank, the banker knew you, and the banker would base his idea of giving you a loan on your own personal behavior. He knew you. Today you go to a bank and of course it's a FICA score, it's a calculation that might be 10 out of New York City. The banks and the local institutions like the schools have a lot less control over the, the people that they serve. These institutions remain, in many ways they're artifacts of the older institutions that were much more powerful. So Cambridge today exists in part because of the housing stock, because of what was created in the mineral spring industry. But the nature of the town is far different, it's less autonomous today and that's part of the, you know, the eclipse of the community. Hi, I'm Dave Matejcik. Uh, I like to call myself the historian of Alliance College. Uh, I grew up in Cambridge Springs and graduated from Alliance. Alliance College was founded in 1912, and the reason that Cambridge Springs was selected is because it was located really 500 miles from New York, 500 miles from Chicago. Um, but what was really important was there was a grand hotel for sale. Uh, the Ryder Hotel was beautiful. Uh, six stories, it was probably one of the largest structures between New York and Chicago. It had a theater, it had a indoor ballroom, it had an indoor swimming pool, tennis courts, a pond. It was a perfect location for a new college. Probably one of the most exciting days in Cambridge Springs history has to be in October of 1912 when the President of the United States, William Howard Taft, came to town. Uh, President Taft was in a bitter uh, election and he came to dedicate the college. Thousands descended on Cambridge Springs for the dedication. Uh, 1916 was also a big event. Uh, Ignacy Paderewski, who later would be the Prime Minister of Poland, a statesman, a known pianist, uh, he addressed the first class of graduates of 1916. That would lead the next year to a very interesting part of the town's history, and it's a, a story that's not really well known. At that time, there were 20,000 immigrants in the United States that were of fighting age that were new uh, Polish immigrants. They weren't yet American citizens, they spoke Polish primarily, but an alliance was struck between Canada, the United States, and the Allies where they would have their own special army and the troops would train in Niagara-on-the-Lake and the officers trained right here in Cambridge Springs. 
To my knowledge, it's the first time a foreign army trained on American soil and they fought beside the U.S. troops in World War I. Uh, 1931 was a very sad time for Alliance College. Um, the Ryder Hotel, January of that year, had a terrible fire. It burned to the ground. Um, the students were displaced, but the Cambridge Springs community reached out. The churches were open for classrooms. Uh, the students were housed in local, uh, local homes. Not a single student left the college as a result of the fire. And Alliance College rebuilt. Uh, they started building Alliance Hall, Washington Hall, and Kosciuszko Hall. Um, and the college would keep going and continuing. Uh, the late 1940s was an exciting time at Alliance College. For approximately five years, actually 46, I believe through 53, the Pittsburgh Steelers made Cambridge Springs and Alliance College their home for their training camp. Um, the Rooney family had a friendship with the president of the college and that led to it. Also, when we get into 1949 and 50, Alliance becomes the home for the, for the San Francisco 49ers and the Los Angeles Rams. Um, not for training, but during the season when they played on the East Coast, Cambridge Springs would become their home for those games. Uh, a lot of excitement at the same time going into the 1950s. 1953, a young pilot named Frank Jarecki uh, in the Russian Air Force, he was, a Pol he was Polish, uh, he defected, he took a MiG and flew it uh, to Belgium where he crash landed it and the United States then had a prize. Well, what do you do with a 19-year-old that only speaks Polish? You send him to Alliance College and he became one of our uh, most famous graduates. That same year, uh, America's Town Hall, which would be broadcast out of New York City, decided that they would do their national broadcast from the Alliance College Gymnasium. Uh, exciting time for Alliance in the 60s, Ted Halleck was the basketball coach. Uh, Alliance had a seven-footer who was from Cambridge Springs named Frank Granite, and he would lead the college to the national playoffs in the NAIA in Kansas City in 1963 and 65. Uh, Frank Granite would be drafted by the New York Knicks. Sadly, the college would close in the 1980s, but our spirit's still alive. In 2012, a marker was dedicated in downtown Cambridge Springs. The Alliance College Alumni Association still has reunions every two years and a scholarship fund for students that are interested in uh, higher education. Oh, the fire of the college burning, yeah. We could watch it from our, as we go upstairs, you know, we had this one window and we watched it burn. And we felt so bad because that's our college, you know. It's our Polish heritage. It was built by the Polish people. They were so proud of it. I can't express how I felt about it. It was very sad. Yeah. So a lot of memories up there, because we used to have a lot of conventions up there, you know, the the Polish conventions and all that, so. And we always had the Steelers used to train up there, you know, and uh, they used to, uh, the fullback, he used to play the piano, and I, my office was there and he was right there, and so. What did I do at the college? I did a little bit of everything. <laughs> yes, I did. I spent my whole life up there. I know about Ted. Oh, he was something else. <laughs> he was Ted. He played basketball up there, and uh, he became the coach there. Yeah, and uh, what was he, basketball coach? And he, uh, phys ed, he had phys ed, yeah. did, did a lot of everything. We'd always go out to Kansas City, you know, for the uh, national basketball tournaments, you know. We'd always go out there. 
and um, the ladies would go out touring, you know, and the men would all gather. So it was nice. I got to meet a lot of the different coaches and their wives. So it was nice. Of course, here we were just a little small college, you know, and we were up with the all biggies, you know, and so I was very proud of him because he did such a good job. He's a, he loved what he was doing, you know what I mean? He loved teaching those boys and disciplining. <laughs> We would watch over them like they were our own kids, you know what I mean? He loved them all. I have a lot of memories. My name is Dan Heim, and I'm going to be discussing my favorite subject, the Cambridge Springs tro Trolley Station and the history associated with it. The trolleys uh, came to Cambridge Springs at the turn of the uh, last century. It was a critical time. What Cambridge Springs had that the other ones didn't have was a railroad station. And that was so important because these were, these were uh, horse and buggy days, and that was the only means of transportation for people. Interestingly enough, the first non-traditional students, or commuters as they were called, to Edinburgh actually tra traveled by trolley. Up until then, it was strictly a normal school, and it was, a, it was an on-site, you stayed there. So that was, uh, that was interesting. So that was important to Cambridge Springs. Uh, 1903, Meadville made their way there. So, and it was a separate line. It came into, uh, it came out of Meadville, uh, uh, out North Main Street, crossed over to Sager Town on 198, came north uh, into Venango and into Cambridge Springs. So they were actually two different uh, trolley stations. One on the, uh, one on the south side of Venango Avenue, uh, uh, Venango Avenue and Wall Street, which was the Meadville station, and this and the one across the street. Now the original station in 1900. Uh, was a rather dilapidated building. We think it was probably a stable or a stagecoach stop or something, but it was not a, a very pleasant situation. And the people out of area were had such a bustling business, and they wanted a better showpiece. So they uh, they built the station that is there now. It built it in 11 months, uh, they, from December until November. And they opened it November 29th, 1910. Beautiful building. Uh, structurally as sound as the day it was born it is today. The history was that a gentleman by the name of uh, Melvin Townley owned the uh, trolley station. He inherited from his dad in 1992. And he worried so much about the, about the future of that, of that trolley station. I was president of the uh, Crawford County Historical Society in 2002 and I was at the fair and I met him. He's telling me this story. So I developed a, uh, a, a relationship with him. Uh, talked to him a lot about it. I would stop there once in a while and see him, and we had a long conversation about what he wanted to do with it and so forth. Uh, he would uh, pass away in 2008, like August 2nd, 2008. We did not know it. I was with the Historical Society, the Crawford County Historical Society at the time. We found out in early 2009 that we had inherited it. And uh, I was absolutely ecstatic because I thought it was, it was just beautiful. It was a mess. There was plaster hanging off the walls everywhere. Uh, it hadn't been heat in there since 1992, and when when Melvin inherited it, uh, and it uh, and, and I'm looking around and it was and the old wiring was still in there, and so forth. And I know it's going to take a lot of work to get it back where it was. But as I said earlier, structurally, it was as sound as the day it was born. The walls were fine. He had put a new roof on it, fortunately, in there. In about 2005, he had a brand new roof put on it, a first class roof too. So it had a lot of upside to it too. So we went in there and stripped, stripped the walls down. Uh, I hauled out actually a pickup load of uh, plaster, and uh, old plaster, and redid all the walls, redid the ceilings, uh, finished them, windows, re you know, uh, stripped all the doors, um, the electrical work. I was not going to mess with electricity, and I knew it had to be fixed. So I got a hold of Rod Frazier, who's, who was the uh, teacher at the Crawford County Career Technical Center. And uh, Rod agreed, he came up and looked at it, and he, he fell in love with it as much as I did. So he got his classes for their senior projects to completely rewire that. Now this is over a, 
In fact, they're still they're still doing, have a little bit of work to do up there. But this is over a eight year period that, that they've been off and on up there. And usually they come up every Wednesday, but uh, they completely put in a brand new 220 service, a, a 110 service in the basement connected into that. We put a new furnace in it, new air conditioning. Uh, they wired all that in. We look at that station as not being ours. Okay, we don't look at it that it belongs to us. I mean, we have the title for it, we have all that type of stuff and everything, and we've done a lot of work there, but it belongs to the community. It belongs to Cambridge Springs and the people that live there. I mean, it's theirs. It's, you know, we're just a caretaker in a window of time is all we are. Uh, and we're proud of it, and we're, we're proud of the work we've done. So we open it, uh, we open it in the summertime in the fall, spring, summer, and fall. We'll probably open it in April again. And it's open on Sundays right now. We think we're gonna open it longer. Anyone who lives in Cambridge Springs and wants to use it for a birthday party or a wine tasting, we've had these things happen, wine tasting or whatever, they, they're more than welcome to use it free of charge. Hi, Randy Gorski. Uh, I am a nearly 30 year resident of Cambridge Springs and for the last 15 years I have served as the mayor here of Cambridge Springs and continued doing that in 2018. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about the gold-headed cane that we give to the oldest citizen in Cambridge Springs. The gold-headed cane got started when uh, the town council started talking about um, the, the older people in our community and what they could do to honor them and it was launched as an idea that we should give and recognize the oldest person in our community in some way and so I'm not sure that clearly who or how it was launched but the gold-headed cane was launched and it was given first to George Humes at that time and the gold-headed cane um, the name of the person the year of their birth the year of their death is um, engraved on that cane. Uh, well, as mayor, um, I am asked sometimes to do ceremonial duties, and I think part of my favorite is when I get asked to go ahead and plan to give the next cane um, away, or the cane, pass it on to the next person. Um, it gives me a chance to get out and thank people who've lived in our community a long time. I would safely say the majority of the people who are getting the cane in recent history have been 90 year olds, so as old as 97, I believe, not too long ago. And so as a ceremonial thing, um, and being the mayor, it, it's just a fun thing to do. It gives you a chance to be personable, to, to meet usually the entire family of the recipient, because that it's a proud moment for them, even though they don't want to mid-age, uh, they do like to be considered the oldest person and that recognition that comes along with receiving a gold-headed cane. Um, what I think this, this gold-headed cane means to the community is it, it is a community of people who um, you know, have sp spent their li entire life here. Probably so, there's a lot of history of Cambridge Springs, from Alliance College to the Riverside Inn and some of our other inns. And a lot of these older people have memories of those types of events. And so I think the, the gold-headed cane is sort of that, that tangible gift, if you will, that says to them, hey, you've lived here all your life, you've contributed all your life, you enjoy and you really love your community. And so again, the, the gold-headed can't be underestimated. It's a, a precious item. It's, it's a precious item. And so when people receive it, not only are we recognizing them as the oldest person, but we're thanking them for their long-term commitment to Cambridge Springs, living here, um, raising families here, and really making the the town, the historic and, and cute little town that it is. And so in my mind, it is just, it brings it all together that you've taken that time to raise your family here and be part of your community. Now you're being rewarded with something that you can be proud of. My name is Patrick Herman and my subjects today deal with military connections, past and present. Uh, there's a real interesting story about uh, the Civil War relating to Cambridge Springs. Elpheus Hodges, who was born in Cambridge Township, uh, served as a corporal in the Union Army. And he maintained that he had actually fired the first Union shot at the Gap Battle of Gettysburg. He and three other men on July 1st, 
1863 were manning an outpost on the Chambersburg Pike when they saw some troops advancing. But they were about a mile away and they couldn't determine who exactly they were. So, so Hodges rode up on to a hill to get a better vantage point and could see that they were Confederates. And as he turned to go back to warn his fellow soldiers, he was fired upon. So he took cover behind a nearby bridge abutment and returned fire. So these are what he maintained as the very first shots for the Battle of Gettysburg. World War II was a war where the entire country was behind it, simply because of the way we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. And Cambridge Springs, like other small towns, had a, a fairly large contribution, and it was larger than I anticipated when I did the research. An unofficial count shows that 560 men and women from the greater Cambridge Springs area actually served during World War II. Back then, that large families were prevalent in the 1930s and 40s. It was not uncommon for four, five, six, or even more siblings to have served in the war at the same time. In fact, we even had one family, the Staborskis, who had 10 sons serve in the military, ranging from World War II up through the uh, Korean War. We actually have two generals, believe it or not, that came from Cambridge Springs. Air Force Brigadier General Mark Stillwagon, who retired in 2017, and Marine Corps Lieutenant General Gary McKissick, who retired in 2002. The biggest military presence currently we have, of course, is our striker unit. When George W. Bush was president, some of his policymakers came up with a program to consolidate National Guard units into so-called readiness centers. Consequently, the units in Meadville, Corey, and Erie were closed and merged into the large unit here in Cambridge Springs. It opened its doors in July of 2008. Uh, they have three companies there, Bravo headquarters and forward support. Uh, there are currently approximately 400 troops to drill there on weekends. It is the only National Guard designated unit in the United States currently. The other striker units are regular army. Uh, for those unfamiliar with what a striker is, it's a 19-ton uh, armored eight-wheeled vehicle and they were used extensively in Iraq. They're very sophisticated. They even have a self-contained air supply if they come under chemical attack. The unit has had two major deployments. The first in September of 2008, in which they went to Iraq for a year. The second deployment they had was actually in 2015, when Pope Francis came for the World Conference on Families. The unit actually served as a security detail during that time. Uh, the, the stories I've related today are just a small sampling of military connections that have occurred during the history of Cambridge Springs. Hi, my name is Katie Eichenlaub White and I am going to talk about why Cambridge Springs is an important tourist de destination in the past and in the present. Cambridge Springs has a, a rich history. Prior to the 1880s, it was a farming community, uh, dairy farms, but in the, and, and industries related to that. But when Mineral Springs was discovered, everything changed. I live in the historic Amos Kelly House, the only um, residence on the National Registry of Historic Places in Cambridge Springs, along with the Riverside Inn. When uh, Amos Kelly and his wife Adelaide Burchard Kelly uh, moved into Cambridge Springs and opened the, bank, the first bank, they were the people that, um, that Joseph Gray came to looking for money to build the Riverside Inn and start um, the industry and he was directly involved in, the, in not only his own investment in hotels and mineral springs, one of them still stands, the little octag octagonal spring house on Main Street. So in addition to uh, the mineral spring, 
uh, industry. One thing that I discovered by accident was the importance of its role in manufacturing crokinole boards. A crokinole board is an eight-sided board that was used for recreation, and it was a, it had no questionable features, the early uh, ad says, because there, were no, there was no dice or cards involved. <laughs> so it was, it was approved by the churches as, um, as a game that could be played. It turns out that it must have originally come out of Canada, but had never been marketed. And so um, when one of the local residents was working in New York, met the man who was bringing it to the city to patent it. He brought it back to Cambridge Springs because the um, natural hardwoods were a huge feature. That's how the Kellys made their money. They had three sawmills and so, and they had lots of land. And so when um, the, the relationship between the Ross family and the Kelly family, um, and then the manufacturing plant that they put on the railroad station, uh, by, by the railway is how I started this whole process. Found out it's still actively played in Canada. There was a book written about it. They mentioned Cambridge Borough in the Crokinole book, but had no idea where that was or what the story was. So it was that connection that we made between the Canadians who were playing it, who knew the story, but knew nothing about how it came to be, um, so popularized. And um, so we had a Crokinole tournament at, at the Riverside, and it was the beginning of uh, a national connection between people that began collecting and studying the history of Crokinole. I think that if you're a history detective, Cambridge Springs is rich with stories, whether it's the history of Crokinole, whether it's the A number one hobo who published his books out of, out of Cambridge Borough, um, all the shops and the businesses and the, the gaming that um, was a part of its history. It's, it's a great place to come and relax and stay. It's a great place to explore a town that had gone to sleep for many years, but now is reawakening to its own story. My name is Jeremy Ball and I was the general manager of the Riverside Inn for its final seasons here in Cambridge Springs. I started at the Riverside Inn when I was in high school and my career path eventually led me back here to Cambridge to have the opportunity to be the manager. Well, the Riverside Inn was built in the late 1800s. It was part of the mineral water boom in Cambridge Springs and there were over 40 hotels and rooming houses in Cambridge Springs at that time. And we were fortunate enough to be the last operating hotel in Cambridge Springs up until May 2nd, 2017, when our building was destroyed by fire. The Riverside was the place to go. When you came back to visit, when you were away, everyone gathered at the inn. There was a feeling of community and a place of going home. We had so many events, weddings, parties. Our dinner theater drew people in from all over the country. Guests from Pittsburgh, Buffalo, and Cleveland, especially the medieval feast that was formerly known as the Canterbury Feast was a hit every single year and just brought hundreds of people to our town. With being such a large hotel, the, it was hard for people to operate for any given period of time, so it changed hands multiple times over the, over the past, most recently being acquired by Michael and Marie Halliday in 1985. They found, well, Mr. Halliday found the hotel and bought it, and then several weeks later, he brought his wife Marie by and she said it was beautiful, but it'd be so much work. And he said, well, we better get going. I've just already bought it. So uh, she went right to work and they spent countless dollars rest restoring all of the rooms. They all had period furniture. They restored the porches, sided the entire building, brought everything up to code, rewired it, and really built a strong business within the community that it was already there, but they just made it so much stronger. The night of the fire was probably the worst night of my entire life. Um, it just, it didn't seem real. Time passed quickly but slowly at the same time. All I can remember is the amazing amount of people from the community that supported us and were there for us during that hard time. From the firefighters to local business operators, churches, you know, the people from Quickville were bringing us coffee all night long. The Red Cross was there. It was just, the amount of love and emotion in that parking lot that night, you can't even describe it. it. We didn't know what was going on. It didn't seem real, but then, you know, as time crept on in the following afternoon, we saw it just smoldering. It was 
the worst feeling ever, but the, the love and the uh, support of the community helped keep us strong. Well, Cambridge Springs was founded on mineral waters and its healing purposes. It brought people here for, for years for the water until the, uh, the medical professions found that that wasn't quite the case. So with any town, you know, it started on something and ours started with water. But I feel that, uh, you know, as time passes on, we have to find our, our new center of attraction. And it seems to be that uh, we're going to go from water to beer. There are uh, plans for two new brew pubs in Cambridge Springs, one of them being on the former Riverside property. Uh, the other is going to be on Main Street. So I really feel that the town is gonna to remain strong. People are really giving it their all to try to keep things going here. And it's really exciting to see what could happen in the future. And I hope that the community supports everyone's endeavors and bringing people to Cambridge for the, for the future. My name's Tom Glenn. I am the safety officer for the Cambridge Springs Volunteer Fire Department. I'm here today to talk about the fundraising efforts for the Cambridge Springs Fire Department. For years, the main fundraiser for the Cambridge Springs Fire Department has been our annual Fireman's Carnival, held each year, usually in the July time frame. And the support that we get from the borough of Cambridge Springs and surrounding boroughs has, has, has always been tremendous, not only from an, an attendance standpoint, but from a volunteer standpoint. The people of Cambridge Springs uh, come out to help us each and every year. Something new we're trying this year is the Cambridge Springs Music Festival. Uh, historically, it was held at the Riverside Inn, but uh, for obvious reasons, the Riverside Inn uh, no longer standing. The fire department approached the Hallidays, who at the time owned the Riverside, and asked if we could possibly take that over as a fundraiser for the fire department. Uh, a, to help the fire department, B, to help keep the music alive. Uh, at the fire department, we, we feel bad that we were not able to save uh, the beauty that was the Riverside Inn. But we thought, um, in lieu of, of saving the building itself, maybe we can help save the music. And so the, the, the birth of the Cambridge Springs Music Festival as a fundraiser for the fire department uh, came to be. 30 some years that the, the Riverside hosted the music festival. It started out uh, innocuous enough as uh, a bunch of bluegrass uh, musicians getting together to enjoy their music together and, and to jam and to enjoy the beauty that was the Riverside Inn. Uh, over the years, the, the genres of music uh, being brought to the Riverside has changed um, to some, some more mainstream type music. And now that the, the fire department is taking it over, we are expanding not only the, the locations of the music in and around the borough, but also the genres to include uh, everything now from uh, the traditional bluegrass. We will still have a, a bluegrass jam gazebo to a Pink Floyd tribute band. Um, so uh, every, everything in between those, uh, I think you'll be able to experience uh, the weekend of June 15th, 16th, and 17th in 2018. Obviously, with the Riverside demise, we uh, needed a venue. Our fire department's carnival grounds has a main stage that is there that we use for our carnival each year. So we thought, what a, what a better place to, to, to do it. So we're going to utilize that, that permanent stage there. We're also bringing in a temporary stage. Uh, we will, in essence, have two main stages down at the Carnival Grounds, plus our uh, jam gazebo, where the traditional artists can get together and still do the jams like they used to do on the front porch of the Riverside. Historically, our, our Fireman's Carnival, at least in recent history, our Fireman's Carnival has been more of a community carnival where we invite uh, local entities to come in and, and raise funds for their activities as well as for the fire department. What we're looking to do with the music festival, it's basically, it's going to be a fundraiser for the fire department and for the fire department alone. Reason for that being the, the cost of operating a volunteer fire department have skyrocketed. When I first started 34 years ago, we could go and buy a frontline engine for the fire department in the $150,000 range. That same engine today runs pretty much half a million dollars to get one and to get it staffed. So the needs for, for fundraising, uh, unfortunately, 
a vast majority of not just Cambridge Springs Fire Department, but fire departments all over the, the state and all over the country, we have to raise funds. I mean, you know, the, the community at large uh, only has so much money. So by morphing to the music festival, we're hoping to draw people from, from outside uh, the Cambridge Springs area, uh, A, to raise funds for the fire department, and B, expose them to, to the beauty and, and the, the friendliness that Cambridge Springs has to offer. Hello, my name is Brian Harmon and I would like to share some things about bicycling and my love for bicycling and some of the fundraisers I have been involved in. In the spring of 2015, um, I made a decision that I would like to do a fundraiser for some, some group in Cambridge Springs, but I wasn't sure which group to do it with yet. And um, in the in the summer of 2014, we lost one of our firemen. His name was Neil Glenn. And um, he had served in the fire department for 57 years. And the one day in early, I think it was in early June, another fireman, he served for 58 years. And his name was William Cole. And both of these men were dedicated to the fire department. The, one day of his funeral, I went on Venango Avenue and I saw they had a huge flag and it was between two ladder trucks and the funeral procession would go through that into the fire hall. And there was an antique fire truck and they had Bill, Bill's casket on the back of that. And what they called that was his last ride to the fire hall. When I saw that, it just impressed me that that would be the group that I would do the fundraiser for. It was just myself doing bike riding, and when I initially started doing it, I thought I'd go a thousand miles and raise a thousand dollars for the fire department. And um, so I started doing that. And then when we had the Firemen's Festival, I thought I would I would set up a booth there so I could collect some of the pledges that I had received. I first started out with putting it on Facebook and a lot of people had responded to it and how much they would give. So at the Firemen's Festival I collected a lot of that and um, on Thursday I had already collected the first thousand and so I just decided to go further with it. And the next day, um, Matt Knadler, he's with one of the local stations in Erie. So he came up and did a story on it. And through that, a lot of people came and gave me more money at the fire department. And what was interesting after Matt put me on, on the new story, a lot of people would see me riding the bike out in the country and they beeped their horn and ask if I was the guy on the show and they would stop me and give me donations that way too. And in the end, I ended up collecting $2,400 and five cents. And what was neat is my neighbor girl, her name's Devin, and she had been at the fair for all four days. And she asked if she could help donate and all she had left was five cents in her pocket. So she gave that to me. So that's where the five cents came from. And all these examples of people giving and donating money, it shows you what a great community I live in. When there's a cause, people will come out and donate either their time or their, their finances to help a worthy cause. And uh, I just wanted to share also that the fire department, they had an old shed where they kept several of their supplies. And at that time, there was, the roof was leaking and they needed a new shed. And at that time, they were just planning on replacing the roof. But through my donations on the bike fundraiser and some other memorials, they were able to purchase a brand new shed.
Hi, my name is Kimberly Mitchell Glenn, and I'm going to talk to you today about a poker run that we do to make um, money to help make a wish and the community support that we get from Cambridge Springs. Um, I'd like to tell you Danielle's story. Um, she was my daughter, Danielle Mitchell. Uh, she was diagnosed when she was 14 years old uh, with leukemia, and she had an adult form of leukemia, so she was in the hospital for a long stretch of time she was out going home and it was really hard on her and she was ready to, to quit she just didn't want to fight anymore um, so her her organs started to shut down and she was placed in ICU and um, it was at that time that she found out that the wish that she had made to make a wish was approved and she so she suddenly had something to fight for and um, so she did. And she got out of ICU and she slowly started to get better until she eventually got out of the hospital in time to go to Florida to swim with dolphins. Um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience for her. Um, and she maintained that Make-A-Wish saved her life and I certainly agreed with her. Um, she believed that so much that she actually went on to do an internship with Make-A-Wish and then she, in school she did her senior project on that experience. And um, unfortunately when she was 23 she did succumb to her illness. But that was nine years after she was granted her wish that she still lived. So we do a poker run every year. Um, in her memory to make money for Make-A-Wish so that other children can have something to look forward to. But that's something that we need a lot of help with. And the Cambridge Springs community is just phenomenal in helping us with that. No matter where we turn, someone is helping. The Cambridge community, we have, there's many different things that they, they do. Um, some of the businesses give us monetary donations. Um, there's some of the businesses give us things for our Chinese auction, a variety of different items. We have a lot of people that come to volunteer. We've been um, doing this for the past 11 years. This will be our 12th um, annual poker run. And my husband and I have been doing this again with a lot of help from the community. Over the last 11 years, we've raised over $59,000 um, to donate to Make-A-Wish and in, have been involved in granting um, 20 wishes to terminally ill children that uh, would have wishes to have something to look forward to during their illness. I feel it's very important for communities like Cambridge Springs to have projects to work on together. Um, it keeps people close and being able to come together to have that pride in knowing that they have done things together and have helped each other out. Even, even though if it's not something to, to be able to give to each other, but just something to know that they've helped someone. They may not accomplish anything for themselves, but they've helped someone else. Uh, hello, I'm Bob Maloney, and I'm going to talk about uh, Mapledale Farm. And the Maloney Farm is located about two miles west of Cambridge Springs on the Plank Road. And uh, it's a 100-year-old barn that we're in the process of preserving. It's what you call a bank barn because the second elevation of the barn is reached by piling dirt against the foundation and makes the bank. Over a period of years, what happens is these old barns, that bank will eventually push the foundation and that's why you see a lot of old barns in the area that have collapsed. So we had uh, the barn bank dug out and we had the whole foundation replaced. Um, and that seems to be holding the barn together. And plus we've done a lot of interior work. We've re rebuilt the first floor or the second floor on the barn. and. Uh, Hopefully it'll last for another hundred years. 
Well, um, one another thing that we did was we put a barn quilt up. The one that we put up was eight foot square and we incorporated in the design the, the maple trees, maple leaves that are unique to our farm, because it's called Mapledale. And then in the center of the quilt, I put a design that goes along with a bicycle trip that my friend Jay Marcinowski from Enbro and I took in 2015 where we pedaled our bikes from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean from Washington to Connecticut. Um, so in the middle of the, the design I put a like a mountain background with two guys on a bicycle and I put down how many miles we went, 3,900 miles in, in uh, 63 days and I put that in the design of our barn quilt. Uh, another thing we have on the farm is uh, nesting bald eagles and uh, routinely they come and they perch in the uh, maple tree right in front of our barn and they've gotten so I can go out and I can talk, like, talk to them and they won't fly away. Uh, and a couple times they nested in our orchard north of the house, but um, they, they're, it's, they come routinely and it's, it's really something to be able to see them. I, you know, I, I really look forward to it. And then they're flying around the farm all the time. Another f feature that's unique to the farm is the uh, trolley car rail bed that goes through the farm where uh, <clears throat> the trolley used to run from Meville to Edinburgh or go into Cambridge and on to Erie, but it went right through our farm and the bed is still there. And my father said when he was a boy, he used to ride it to school in the Cambridge Springs. And also we have a, an archeological dig on the farm every year. The French Creek Archeological Society has a dig there for a couple weeks every year. Uh, there's a lot of history there. My father had a, a very large artifact collection that he found on the farm. And uh, he was pretty well known in the area of his collection. And, and then they got an interest to dig there. And we've had this dig going on for several years and it's been successful. Last year they found two fire rings plus several artifacts and they've been successful every year and they're planning on coming back again this year. My name is Gwen Campbell and I want to talk about my favorite thing in Cambridge Springs, the stained glass windows of the three stone churches um, as you drive in to town. I, you know, I started at the Methodist Church first and um, it's, a, it's a church that the building was built in 1900 and um, you know, it cost 18, over $18,000 at the time to build, which was a lot of money in 18, in 1900. And, you know, they raised that money from the, uh, the Mineral Springs locally. Just that was a boom for the town and um, brought in, in a lot of outside money and commercial travelers donated to the church, donated for windows. And, but, uh, you know, the congregation and uh, local business people donated money too, so they could bring those, uh, bring those windows to the building and, and just add to the environment there. And the other church is the Presbyterian and that's where my mom and dad were married. So it holds a, holds a special place to, to my, in my heart. And um, the, uh, the windows there, they were placed over time. They weren't all put in at the time that the building was built in, in 1896. And uh, so different families were able to uh, to donate and make those windows in honor of loved ones or uh, friends. And uh, one of those windows was put in in 1923, and that was the same year that um, a 500 year old painting was also bought and put in the church, painted by a Veronese painter from Verona, Italy back in 1515. And you know, who would, would guess that that would be in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania. It's just such a treasure to have. Another, you know, another interesting piece of artwork, I feel it's artwork in, in the Presbyterian Church is the pipe organ. They don't have the organ any longer, but they still have the pipes there and they're just, they're huge um, behind the, the pulpit. The history of those, that of that pipe organ is, is interesting too, because um, 
they had to raise money for it and they asked Andrew Carnegie of Pittsburgh to donate and he donated a thousand dollars to purchase that organ. Then they raised the other thousand with kraut suppers and selling aprons and pies. Just a neat way of, of the community coming together and building something for the future. And the other church that, that I really, really love, St. Anthony's, so their windows in their church, they have 30 of them. And uh, they're on the sides, they're on behind, they're behind the altar, and the transept window is of St. Anthony, who is patron saint of sick. So uh, that is a memorial to the cures at the Mineral Springs. Uh, I think the, the neatest thing about the churches that I found as I was reading about their history was um, the amount of money that it took them to build these buildings. They, they raised the money and I, you know, they, they took out loans, they paid them back um, just so quickly. It was because of the spirit of the community that they had. I, they, they had um, offerings. Uh, one offering was like $8,000 in one night I, in such a small town. And at that time, that was huge. That would be huge for, for today. And it, you know, it's just, that just speaks to the, the spirit of community. And I don't think that was just um, something that was from back then. I think it was, that is present today in Cambridge Springs too. My name is Pastor Tommy O'Leary. I'm uh, with Cambridge Springs Presbyterian Church. I just want to tell you a little bit about our history and some of the things that are going on now. We started out in 1852 on Church Street, where else? Uh, it was a quaint, nice old ch church building, but we outgrew it, or they outgrew it, and uh, we moved over to South Main Street in 1895. And the pastor then, Reverend Grassy, was able to build up the congregation in his time to about a hundred, no, 295 members, which was pretty impressive for a town this size. Currently, we've been able to build up our choir again. Uh, we have a blended service of new and old music. Uh, I, I'm able to uh, play my guitar there and do some of the songs that I've written. And the place is just a warm, inviting place. Anybody who comes in there is automatically made to feel very much at home. And it's the kind of thing where you see a stranger, you bring them on in, he'll sit next to me. Uh, where in some churches, you're not sure if they knew you were there or not. So uh, just the warmth of the church uh, is, I would say, its biggest draw. The, uh, the church is also organized with uh, all the other churches in the area. Is six total, and we do uh, combined worship services on occasion, uh, Christmas, Good Friday. In fact, two ladies after the last Christmas Eve service, I heard them say, we should do that more often. That was really good. Um, we are also in, uh, involved in the food pantry, and my church is the emergency backup food pantry. So we're involved in the community, uh, involved with other churches, and just taking care of each other. When they built that church, they knew how to build them. Uh, it's a beautiful red brick building, and it has all kinds of stained glass window. There's one beautiful painting of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Um, it has those beautiful exposed beams on the top, and everyone who comes in, the first thing they say is, wow. And uh, so it's a beautiful place to worship both physically and spiritually. Uh, for a small community like this, people find a family. They find a place to belong. They have a purpose in the things that we do in the church and outside of the church and it gives them hope for a future uh, in this life and in the next. 
So I think that that really does uh, solidify the community. Hi, I'm Janet Beanlin, and my topic today is the First Baptist Church of Cambridge Springs. In 1812, the church, the congregation, began out at Miller Station, which is about three miles northeast of Cambridge Springs. A Reverend Miller and his wife and his nine children were the first settlers in Rockdale Township, and he just he was a very uh, religious man. His name was George and he decided to start a church. There were 12 members at the, uh, the first church, and um, they had a little cabin, and it was built in 1808, even before the church started. Isaac Kelly also helped him, and they met at his house at some time. As the church grew, uh, they decided they would uh, build a meeting house and it's about where the Methodist Church at Miller Station stands today in the cemetery. And from there, the church began to grow. And for some reason, and I don't have this exactly in my minutes, um, there were more people from Cambridge Springs coming out to Miller Station. And we don't know exactly how they got there either because there were no bridges. They must have come up French Creek uh, into Miller Station. So they decided to build a meeting house in Cambridge Springs. This was uh, later in the 1800s. The first one was over by Hendrickson's Hardware, that's still standing today on Railroad Street. And then they grew some more. So then they decided they needed a larger uh, church. So they bought property on the corner of Beach Avenue and South Main Street and they built a church there. The church uh, was a typical, typical kind of Baptist church. It's white and it has a steeple and it's still standing there today. It's had a lot of additions, renovations. The basement's been dug out over the years, but um, the shell is still there today. In 1912, this, the church started and celebrated, uh, that was our 100th anniversary in uh, 2012. That was the church's 200th anniversary. By then we had put on a large addition. Uh, we had owned the house beside it and we tore that down and a large addition was put on so that we had upstairs um, Sunday school rooms, um, kitchen, all purpose room. We had a celebration um, where we had a dinner and we didn't want anyone cooking, so we asked uh, our fellow uh, neighbors, St. Anthony's Catholic Church, and we used their facilities and had it catered. We had a program and went over the history of the church, and um, we, it was just a really good celebration. Today, the church is 205 years old, uh, back in 2017, it was 205 years old. We are one of the largest and the oldest American Baptist churches in the state of Pennsylvania. Today, our Sunday morning service, we have two services um, because we can't all fit in one anymore. Our pastor, Reverend Rod Beardsley, has been with the congregation for 37 years. And last July, uh, we hired an associate pastor. His name is Reverend Phil Lowther and he is a full-time pastor also. Hi, my name is Denise Powell, and I'm here to talk to you about all of the outdoor activities that we have to offer in the Cambridge Springs area. The number one thing that you would see when you come into town is you would cross a bridge going over French Creek. French Creek offers you things from kayaking to motorboating and fishing, and you can fish um, from the shores or you can fish from your boat if you're fortunate enough, enough to have one. We are thankful to the Fireman's Carnival Grounds where you can put your boats in. We also have fishing access areas that you can launch from. Some of the things that you can do that involve a group would be on Saturday of Labor Day weekend, the Venango firemen have a dice drift. And so start out in the morning in Cambridge and you end up down in Venango 
and it's a very popular event. Sometimes there's 300 people on the creek, and it's a wonderful fundraiser for the firemen. You can fish some of the fish. We've had pike and muskie. You can get largemouth and smallmouth bass. There's also a very popular creature that has an official name called the hellbender, but growing up as kids, we called them a mud puppy. Being in Cambridge Springs, you might be a little bit intimidated by going outside of the boundaries unless you like to do things that the outside has to offer. And we like to go hunting and fishing. And in this area, we have the state game lands and we have black bears, we have coyotes, we have fisher cats, we have the white-tailed deer, we have bunnies and pheasants and turkey, and it's just a lot to offer everyone. It's, we're very thankful that we do have the Springs Rod and Gun Club and the Enboro Shooting Club, where kids are taught gun safety right from the get-go, and we've had many kids go to states for the shooting competitions. Cambridge Springs not only offers water sports, but we have winter sports where you can go downhill skiing at Mount Pleasant. Hiking opportunities in Cambridge Springs um, can be found just walking around town. You can see people out walking at 4.30 in the morning, 4.30 in the evening. You'll see the Cambridge Springs cross country kids running um, year round. There's the Land of Lakes, there's the Johnstown, um, trail where people that are um, even in a wheelchair are able to go for a stroll. There's also the trolley trail off of Swamp Road if you go off of Route 408 and you're, it's a little bit more challenging. There are some steeper inclines, wear good shoes, be prepared to see wildlife. One of the fun wildlife things that we have out there, lots of birds, but we have sandhill cranes and we have herons and eagles and well the young people and young at heart like to do in this area is have a campfire or a bonfire. And if you like to look at the stars, when we have a clear night outside of Cambridge Springs is one of the darker areas of the county and you are able to just see the sky sparkle. When people ask me, you know, what is there to do around Cambridge Springs? It's, they would think that there's not a lot. We're very blessed that we have year-round activities regardless of the weather. There's no reason to not be able to get out and enjoy the outdoors. Hi, my name is Haley Rogers and today I'll be talking about the Cambridge Springs High School Leadership Council. Leadership Council is a group of caring students that promote positive activities and opportunities for students among the high school. The Leadership Council is open to apply for grades 7 through 12. All you have to do is sign a pledge saying you'll stand tall against bullying, drugs, alcohol, and just list the different attributes that you can bring to the Leadership Council. There is also a essay that you must write to join Leadership Council, just listing attributes and stuff that you can bring to the Leadership Council. Currently, there are 56 active members in the Leadership Council, all under the direction and guidance of the high school teacher, Mrs. Angie Mumford. Uh, Leadership Council hosts many different events, as in like prom to dawn, to keep kids safe and fun during prom night. They host many different assemblies for like the Blue Devil Nation games, uh, any kind of pep rallies, assemblies, homecoming assemblies, and anything to help the school. Uh, Leadership Council helps the community by, we've served the local veterans at the VFW, we host community movie nights and the mission is just a canned good to donate to the local food bank. We serve our senior citizens at the Gold Card Luncheon and we also sell daffodils during daffodil days to raise money for cancer awareness. I like being in Leadership Council because it can help improve any leadership skills and just help Leadership Council at all by having a view of like a younger student to tell them anything that somebody like younger in grade seven or eight that would like about an assembly or something. I think it's very important to have leadership council because we run a lot of the things throughout the school and and the community and we make things fun for the different kids so that way they can learn in a fun way or live in the community and do different things that's fun. Hi, I'm Amanda Scott, and today I'm going to talk about Cambridge Springs Public Library. Cambridge Springs Public Library was first incorporated in 1928. Um, they were housed in the borough building at that time, which now houses the museum. 
The library was gifted um, money to build a new library on their own. And when they received that money, it was no longer enough money to be able to build a library. So the town had to come together and really fundraise that money of, of their own means. There were plays that were put on, shows that were done, um, different community organizations supported that endeavor and eventually they were able to raise the money and uh, it was I think about 10 years that that took. The new building where the library currently is was dedicated in 1976 and we are on the corner in front of where the Riverside used to be. Today the library has many programs for the community. Our biggest event is our summer reading program. We do events for uh, small children all the way through adults. We have preschool story hour, we do book clubs. Um, it's, it's a really fun time at the library. We currently get about 100 kids um, each summer come into various events and we've had petting zoos. Uh, last year we had a bounce house. We always have a community picnic at the end that's open to anybody. It's a really great uh, programming at no charge to our community. Uh, the library has um, a couple of great programs that we do with younger kids. One of them is the Therapy Dogs. We work with a couple of different organizations for that. One is Tails That Wag, and people bring their certified therapy dogs in, and kids are able to choose a book to read to the dog. The program is really great for reluctant readers, kids that might um, have a little bit trouble reading out loud, and it makes them more confident because a dog isn't judging you. So they're able to, to read and kind of have that time. And, and the little kids, even if they're not able to read, they can tell the dog a story or just pet the dogs. Um, a program that the library has coming up in February is we have a stuffed animal sleepover. So kids are invited to come and uh, we have animals that they're able to make their own stuffed animals. So they actually get to stuff it and they put a little heart inside of it. And the animals spend the night at this, the library, not the children. <laughs> um, and so then, during the evening, while the children leave the animals, they do things at the library which we take pictures of. And so the kids come pick up their animals on the next day and they get to see the adventures that the stuffed animals had at the library. Cambridge Springs Public Library serves a service area of about 8,000 people. Um, currently we have around 3,000 library patrons and each year we circulate almost 20,000 items. So that shows that our community is using us, but we're always happy to have more people come in and use our services. In Cambridge Springs, the library um, can be kind of the center of the town. People come in, they're able to chat with their neighbors, they're able to see what's going on, and they're able to take advantage of the services that the library offers them. Um, the cost effectiveness of being able to check out books and read the newspaper is good for people who don't want to spend the extra money on those things, and then they get the community benefit on top of that. Hi, my name is Brian Sprague. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Sprague Farm and Brew Works, uh, our brewery in Cambridge Township. The farm was actually, of course, the land had been here for a long time, <clears throat> but the, the first building on here was built in 1888. Uh, both the main barn where the brewery is that we're inside of right now and the house out front. Um, there was a succession of owners till the people we bought it from was Ray and Helen Daniels. They bought it in 1942, and they owned it for 45 years until we bought it in 1997. Uh, the Daniels Farm was supposedly one of the biggest dairy farm dairy operations in Crawford County for a long time. He had uh, took pride in his, his farm, uh, so when we bought place. The barn was intact. We find a lot of the old barns now are falling down from the fact that there's no livestock in them because the livestock actually helps keep the barn warm. Uh, so we were fortunate when we bought this to be able to have an intact barn and that's uh, one of the reasons we knew when we wanted to put the brewery in we'd be able to put it, put it in this barn because it was still sound. So. Very fortunate, uh, there's two sides to this barn. We're in the newer side, which was built 60 years ago, 1958. The other side was built in 18, the late 1800s. When my wife and I, Minnie, got married in 1981, yeah, that's it. <laughs> we bought a house right next door to the farm, and the gentleman, uh, Ray Daniels, you know, he's still farming at the time, but he's starting to get a little older. And I started to talk to him about possibly buying the farm. Got to be friends with him, per se, 
I'd come up and help him with chores and stuff, and he, uh, we could never come up with a real deal as to, you know, how we could buy it, we were going to trade houses, but we never could come up with a deal, and eventually he got, you know, bad enough yet they had to put him in a care facility, and his daughters knew we were interested, so they came to us and asked us if we were interested in buying it, and, uh, we were, I was going through a job change at the time, and I wasn't sure it was going to really work out, but uh, my sister and, and all her wisdom said, yeah, let somebody else buy it and put in a toxic waste dump or like a giant, uh, you know, uh, nuclear power plant or something. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I get it. So we bought it, and I wanted to do a brewery for many, many years prior to that. Uh, I started brewing in the late 70s, but when I you know, knew the barn was in good shape, and I said, boy, if I could ever do it, we could ever do it, Minnie and I, we, this would be a great place to do it, even though it's in the middle of nowhere, per se. I mean, it's on a main thoroughfare, and uh, we've had to make it a destination, but the idea was when we started it, to keep it a farm. Uh, so we do do some farming here, uh, and it's been a great adventure, and we continue to learn all the time, but uh, we still make it a place where people can come and sit and relax and enjoy some good music and very good beer and some nice food, and. Uh, we try not to make it too high tech. People bring their own phones and stuff here, but it's pretty bit laid back. Yeah, this has uh, been a great experience, with, you know, because we opened this and we hoped the community would support us, and they've really been outstanding. You know, we didn't realize that, I mean, I knew there were crap beer drinkers and the trend was starting to go our way and that way, and uh, so we've had great support from people in Cambridge Springs. Bonango, Sagertown, you know, the, the local area. So we hope that we're giving back to them because we try to do benefits for, well, QLN and, you know, when we can. And uh, we do, you know, people come here, they want to have a benefit for the Audubon Society um, and a shelter. We try to do, give back the YMCA. I mean, I could keep naming them off, but uh, that gives us as much satisfaction as, you know, making beer and having people enjoy it and hopefully that you know gives it back to the community while they're giving to us and we really appreciate it. It's just nice to see people come through that live down the road and hopefully that uh, pays off and you know not just the fact that we could hopefully make some money from it but also makes us a community place where people come and gather because they feel it's part of their community and that's certainly been our idea from the outset and it, it seems to be it have been embraced so really very thankful for that. Hi, I'm John Anderson. I'm with the Cambridge Springs Kiwanis. My wife Judy and I, who's with the Gamsack Women's Club in town, came across this program we call Christmas for Kids a number of years ago. It's been a wonderful thing. The Cambridge Springs Kiwanis Club has been around the community for 66 years and actually this program we call Christmas for Kids has as well. It goes back probably to days when there were several merchants in town and became part of the Cambridge Springs Exchange Club. Took this project on. It's basically trying to get Santa Claus to bring a little more cheer to some homes that otherwise might not be just so happy because of some difficulties they may be having. We accumulate those names uh, through various sources, the ministerium, through forms we have to the library, and also the youngsters at the school take them home and we find out just who they are in the sense of size, and boys or girls, and ages, and we make some appropriate gifts, get some appropriate gifts together. Currently, the two organizations, uh, the Women's Club and the Kiwanis Club, uh, muster together as many as 50 volunteers, I'm gonna suggest. Uh, there's 10 to 12 hardcore that put in more hours than others, as many projects like this do. But we'll find ourselves with uh, the wrapping day when we try to wrap presents for these kids, and let me quantify that a little bit for you. We generally are seeing somewhere around 120 to 130 youngsters, uh, and that is about 55 to 60 households. Now when each youngster is getting a gift of a book, a uh, toy animal or stuffed animals, hats and mittens, new clothing items, a top and bottom, a complete outfit, and at least one toy, that puts at least three or four gifts times 120 or so and it makes for a pretty big job of getting them wrapped. And I will tell you that it's a wonderful thing to see as many as 30 or so volunteers 
at the fire hall, and we utilize the quite angle fire hall as we call North Pole South, to go in there on a Sunday afternoon and wrap, and we are probably done in about an hour and a half's time. They get serious about it. There's a lot of paper and a lot of ribbon flying. From there, then, we group these by routes, and we have a day that's picked prior, the week prior to Christmas, when we have generally about eight Santas, it's been as few as five, but typically eight or nine Santas and their elf drivers that load up the vehicles on a Wednesday evening or Thursday evening and head out to the countryside. Um, there are country folks, and particularly because we service those in the Cambridge Springs attendance area, we find ourselves on quite a ride. Quite a ride. Most of the students are home and uh, are surprised to see us because it's a secret between mom and Santa that he's coming. Um, Santa will knock on the door and we hope that uh, the, the, the pet dog is tied up in the back and otherwise not available. Hasn't always been that way, but most times it's a friendly reception. Santa will go in and do this ho-ho thing, which means distribute some gifts, but it means more than that too. We have a lot of anonymous givers, and one that we're really proud of is the young fellow that comes forward with apples and fruit and candy canes for each of these youngsters. And it's probably an apple or an orange so large these youngsters haven't seen one before. There's a lot of noise. This coming from a Santa who's been able to be in, in, in that chair in that living room many times and see that happen. But one of the beautiful things is that for the last several years, the employees at the Cambridge Springs Lord Plant have bothered themselves to afford and, and bundle uh, a dinner, a box of uh, all the groceries needed to put together a wonderful dinner. So while Santa loads up the Christmas tree, the kitchen gets a little delivery as well. Uh, needless to say, there's some tears in all of that. Uh, there's a lot of surprise and a lot of happiness that happens, which is the gist of what Santa's there for, just to make Christmas a little bit easier and a little bit better for that household. One of the things that makes this program work is, of course, the volunteers that we have. Not many of them are affiliated with the churches or the clubs that I just mentioned. Many are just individuals that have a heart to do this. In fact, many times we'll find, even for those who are rapping, and especially for those who are making the Santa visits themselves, they'll tell me, put me on the list for next year. It makes Christmas for me. It's what it's all about to see those kids in their surprise. And frankly, we know they're genuine. And, and I've often said to others, uh, it's, it's really moving not only to be the Santa and make the delivery, but when the Santas come back to the North Pole South, the Venango Fire Hall, the women have supper for them. These Santas and their helpers have been on the road since five o'clock and it's generally 7.30 or eight and they have a supper. Sitting there enjoying supper and hearing their stories and seeing wet cheeks on Santa Claus is a beautiful thing and kind of underscores why we have no problem with volunteers. Many of those volunteers, uh, and even each year, I've seen to find new faces and new volunteers come in, and one or more will say, I can remember when Santa came to my house, and this is payback time. Santa was on one of his last stops and heading back towards the fire hall. Knocked on the door, went in, and there was a little, little Joey, we'll call him. Oh, about waist high, young fella so excited to see Santa and just all over Santa hugging him by the leg and all that and Santa gets his bag out and distributes the gifts and, the, and, and it's just a wonderful thing and Joey's mom is there and she says as I was leaving the house I want to see you on the front porch just a moment so we exit we go out on the front porch and she said how did you know I said ma'am I said what do you mean how did you know she said I just told Joey that there wouldn't be a there wouldn't be not be a Christmas this year because Joey's daddy just left yesterday, and we don't have a car, we don't have money, we weren't gonna have Christmas, and then you walk in. How did you know? Well, ma'am, whether we knew and how we knew, all I simply said was, Santa knows more than you know, and Santa's got Joey on a list, and we left it at that. But I tell you now, that uh, that was a number of years ago, and it still rides with me, still it's close to the heart. Gosh, whenever you think about loving this town of Cambridge Springs, it's, for me, it's, it's history. I mean, I, I just, I love history. Teaching for 34 years, I mean, it's, it's just that history that's always captivated me. And I mean, I, I'm all about amusement parks and, and what went on in this town. And so it's just, I just, it's the history of it, to dig into that and find out more. What I love about Cambridge Springs is that it's really 
rediscovering its history, its value, its importance as a destination. But yeah, it's it's a history, and uh, you know I go back to the Riverside Inn, which I think all of us had such a warm spot in our hearts. And we grew up, you know, we grew up with the, with, with that. Uh, the history of, the, of the, the Mineral Springs and the huge hotels that were there, the Ryder Hotel. Uh, I think those are all, uh, I, I think the, the, the unique history is probably my favorite thing about, about Cambridge Springs. Well, my professional career was made in Cambridge Springs. I came to Cambridge Springs not knowing where it was. I'm from Pittsburgh. But as I worked in this town, I learned my craft. The town was very patient with me and very supportive of some of the work I've been able to do for their young men and women. I'm still a very enthusiastic supporter of history and the town that has done well for us and for my career. And I'm grateful to have, you know, staked my professional career in, in the community and giving back some of the history, not just of their town, but of their world. You know, um, my favorite thing about Cambridge Springs is really, of course, everybody probably says it's the history. I, you uh, look at the buildings that are still there that were built in the, you know, during the big mineral spring days, and there's really, really some awesome buildings there. And just to look back and see that how many people came through this area, it was like the hub. When I think of the favorite things I like about Cambridge Springs, I, I, I do like the quaintness of a small town like Cambridge Springs, but I also like the proximity. We're pretty much equidistant from Cleveland, Buffalo, and Pittsburgh. And let's not forget that we're the halfway point between New York City and Chicago. My favorite thing about Cambridge Springs is probably the heritage that I have there. I, my mom was born and raised there, so um, I grew up playing in Cambridge Springs when I was little and have a lot of memories from the town. Well, what's not to love, you know? It's, uh... I've grown up here and all my friends are here. Uh, just, it's just a beautiful area and having a French Creek in our backyard. And uh, you know, I just, you couldn't ask for anything better. What do I like about this area? Oh, I just, I guess I like it because I've been here all my life, you know. It's, um, it's just home. The people have always been nice to each other. And very um, concerned about them, about their neighbors, you know, and um, it's just home. I moved to Cambridge Springs in 1969 from down just north of Pittsburgh. The, the, the atmosphere is so totally different here. I, mean, I, I raised my two children here, my, my two granddaughters are, are here, and to this day, I pretty much know what they've done that day before they tell me. Uh, they can be walking down the street and uh, one of our neighbors, you know, in passing will say, oh yeah, I saw Bella today. She was wearing her nice pink coat. Or It's just, and you, and you have no qualms about letting, letting your children walk the streets of Cambridge Springs. It's, it's, it's a safe, welcoming place to raise a family and now to start raising a grand family. Walking down the streets, you could say hi to somebody. Um, I lived in the city for a little while, and it was like you were afraid to even speak to somebody on the streets. It's just wonderful, but living in a small town that um, you could just depend. If you, you're walking down the street and going to a store, somebody opens the door and holds it for you. It doesn't matter if they know you or not. And it's just it's just that small town thing where everybody just is nice and helpful and and I wouldn't live anywhere else. I just wouldn't change it for the world. I love Cambridge Springs and just love the people that are here. I grew up in Cambridge Springs. Um, I love the community, always have. Although I live in Ohio now, uh, my siblings and myself, we still keep a resident, or the same childhood resident. What I love most about Cambridge Springs, it's simple, it's the people. Oh, the people of this area are special. Uh, when I said maybe perhaps the community is not unique, yes, all communities have good hearts and big hearts, but this town, this community, is known for it. And there are so many of them around that just when one peters out, another one steps forward, just as this program has continued all these decades. My favorite thing about Cambridge Springs uh, are the people. They're warm, they're down to earth. Uh, they don't put on any airs. 
and that makes me feel kind of comfortable. My favorite thing about Cambridge Springs is the peace, the, the feeling of community, and the feeling of safety. It's also very unique to see how it can go from a quiet, small town to when activities are going on, how everyone pours out and supports one another. What I really like about Cambridge Springs, as somebody who wasn't originally from this town, is it's a very civic-minded community. People are really excited to get involved and to help out, and um, they're free with their donations of their time and money to support causes they believe in. What I love about the Cambridge Springs area is how the people connect with each other, the heart of the people in town. They're, they're always coming together. A lot of times different groups will come together to make something happen. My favorite thing about Cambridge Springs would be the people and the events. And it is a community that has faced a lot of struggles over the years, this past year in particular. But they're always pulling together to do something fun as a community. Well, I've lived in Cambridge Springs for my whole life, and I love how it's just a small community, but we're all friends and family, and we can just communicate and do different things together as a whole community. Well, I have uh, lived here most of my life, about 70, 70 years, and um, I like a small town community that is um, very good about uh, helping one another, being involved. Well, I, I moved here 30 years ago to Cambridge Springs uh, as an Edinburgh student. I fell in love with the little town. Uh, at that time, the woods behind the Alliance College and the bridge, it was always something that was attractive uh, for you to do. Come over to Cambridge and walk. The streets of Cambridge Springs are beautiful. The Riverside Inn was here. The, a lot of neat little places. And so I find this the small town atmosphere and the people here in Cambridge Springs, that uh, it's very engaging. Uh, the people are friendly. The churches are very strong in Cambridge Springs. And so there's that family atmosphere of all the churches. So I came to Cambridge Springs and continue to live here because I feel very strong about family connectedness. And I think Cambridge Springs offers that, as well as having some beautiful uh, buildings, some beautiful things happening. And despite our fires that have changed the course of our history, we have a lot of new things that I believe are going to move the community forward in the near future. Our Town Stories from Cambridge Springs is brought to you in part by Centera Co-op, a progressive agricultural co-op with a rich history in farming. Their roots in the cooperative system date back over 80 years, and by supporting youth and families, they believe they can accomplish their passion to see the community in which we live and work thrive. Their team of experts are all dedicated to working hard toward a common goal, yours. Agronomy, grain, feed, energy, lumber, and retail. Sentara Co-op is standing with you shoulder to shoulder. Craig Newell Welding Incorporated a custom fabrication business that has been in Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania for more than 30 years. With a 20,000 square foot facility, Craig Newell Welding offers full service custom fabrication including metal fabrication, abrasive water jet cutting, traditional and robotic welding, machining, metal prep, and powder coating. As a one-stop shop, Craig Newell Welding Incorporated covers all fabrication needs. Our town stories from Cambridge Springs is also brought to you in part by viewers like you. Thank you.